We will take the next set of questions from Alistair Bishop with MMA Republic. Marv, how are you, sir? I'm wonderful. How are you? Uh, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I know this narrative between two teammates and former training partners have been played out quite a lot, and, and I'm, I'm sure you're pretty tired of answering the question. But what, if anything, has, has surprised you the most between uh, yourself moving and, and what's being said by, by Gilbert Burns? Um, I wouldn't say that I'm surprised by a lot of it because um, you have to expect that from when someone calls you out and says, hey, I want to challenge you. You know, you have to expect that they're going to say and do whatever is possible and necessary for them to to form that belief in themselves that they, they can get the job done. I, I, um, I honestly, I, I would be, um, I'm a human being with human emotions. And, um, you know, when you spend so much time with, with, uh, with that team, I've always been there. That was where my career was with, you know, with the black zillions and then, you know, over, uh, H kickboxing, I was always with them. And when you are the guy who kind of helped, you know, I, I was there from the start and you go in and you give them the, uh, the world championship. It's, um, and then, you know, things kind of play out the way that they're playing out. It's kind of tough when you, you know, people start taking sides. That's, that's a tough one, you know, and, um, you know, I would be honest if I said that that wasn't kind of the most surprising thing to me. But at the end of the day, so you got to expect it. You know, he's coming up, he's coming and he feels prepared and he feels like he's ready to, to go out and, and take me out. And it's my job to go in there and let him know that, hey, it's a dream. You know, one day it might happen, but not while I'm on the throne. He, he mentioned, I think the question was about his, his title reign uh, as a champion and, and, and he was issuing out a warning to the top 15. What does that make you feel like? Has the has the respect level for for Gilbert Burns changed by the way he's almost looking past you and, and and saying things like coaches and teammates know about you and they're all kind of chipping into your demise? Does that change the, the respect level? I I didn't get the first part of that. You said um you said what? He was planning his title reign already. About you know the the whole of the top three, fifteen was already in trouble. Yeah, no, it, no, I mean, it, it is what it is. He has to say that. I mean, it, it's, it, we hear it time and time again. Guys have to, uh, they have to, if you, if you don't believe in yourself, then why are you even in there? Or if you don't say you believe in yourself, why are you in there? Everyone has to, everyone has to say that. Uh, I'm sure Kobe Covington was planning his title reign as well. I'm sure Tyron Woodley wanted to continue his title reign. And I'm sure Jorge Masvidal, you know, the street Judas or street Jesus, whatever they call him, I'm sure, uh, he was planning a, a title reign, fighting this guy and that guy and all of this. They all plan that. You know, it is what it is. At the end of the day, all I can do is is worry about myself and the things that I can control going into the fight. And as long as I've done that, then the outcome should be what it should be. The the, the new look of your new look out at your camp, Justin Gaethje and Trevor Whitman, what would you say is the biggest takeaway or the biggest lesson you've learned from both Justin Gaethje and Trevor Whitman? Well, I would say um, with Trevor, I, I think it's it's just the basic fundamentals. Like, um, and I knew it, you know, kind of in my career, there was certain times where um, I would be preparing for a fight and and I felt like, okay, I needed to spend more time on this. I'm not sharp here with this. Like my, my footwork is not there. Um, my balance is not there. I, I just, I'm not sharp there. But, you know, you're, I'm on a team with 40, 50 guys and the coaches are gone every other weekend training and coaching other guys. So I kind of have to be the one to do the best that I can to bridge that gap on my own. And, and now kind of getting back to those basics. I mean, at the end of the day, we all, everyone's kind of hit a heavy bag. Everyone knows how to hit hard. We all know that. I have punching power. He has punching power. But it, it's it's those fine details of, okay, this is, you step here, and this is why you step here. You throw the punch here, this is why you excel. You know, and this is why you squeeze your stomach. This is why you pull in tight. This is why the guard is up. This is why we roll with this. Just those fine details, I think, are, are what then starts to separate the, the good from the great. It's just learning those small details. And, and it was very tough to get those details 
on a team with 40, 50 guys with maybe four coaches and the coaches are gone every other weekend. And so I would say, yeah, that that's kind of been the biggest key of, of is getting that attention and being able to, to work on those details. And then with Justin Gaethje, it's just, I mean, being around a madman, you know, I, I, I call him a <laughs> madman because um, he's just somebody who likes to, he, he's just there to fight with Justin. Uh, I'm going into sparring and it's crazy. It's like um, normal days. It's like, okay, I have wrestling practice today. Okay. It's going to be a tough one, but it is what it is. You know, I'm used to that. I'm going into grappling. Okay. It is what it is. I'm used to that, but it's like, okay, I have to spar and I know Justin's going to spar. Something about it is just, you, you kind of get a little that little feeling in your stomach, those little butterflies, like, okay, I'm going to get punched today. It's going to be all right. I, you kind of got to get up for it. And then when he comes in, he's just like a hurricane. He doesn't spare anything. He'll just jump right on you. And so that's been great to uh, have someone who puts me in the fire. You know, I'm able to still feel that fire. Yes, it's a, it's a new surrounding, new environment, but I'm still able to feel that fire to where when I get in there, that's not going to be a foreign feeling to me. Fantastic. Uh, Kamara, obviously from South Africa, there's a lot of talk about the African UFC and, and we were all campaigning really hard to, to make that a reality, hopefully, when, when all this COVID stuff is over and then the world returns to normal. How, how do you envision a Africa UFC event and, and how far do you think we are away from it? Honestly, I don't think we're far at all. I think... Um... The tough, the tough thing is just, you know, the, the higher ups and the execs just, you know, are able to say, OK, we're, we're going to do whatever it takes to make it happen. Uh, because obviously there's there's intricate details that a lot of people don't know that goes into uh, bringing events to certain places as far as, you know, transport, just financial, financial wise and, and not just financially, but also logistics and, and making sure everything works out. There's a couple of uh, countries down in, Af in the continent of Africa who are definitely capable of being able to host and, uh, and, and make this thing come to fruition. And uh, it's just kind of up to the company to uh, basically decide if, hey, we're going to make this happen. Because sooner, <laughs> sooner than later, we're about to have, we're about to have three African-born champion, Africa champions all holding belts. So, I mean, we're going to have to make something happen sooner or later. And um, and I envision that just being one of the most memorable and massive events that uh, this company has ever seen. Fantastic. There's definitely going to be a, a couple of young Africans and especially South Africans listening and watching this. So a, a two-part question. What would you say to, to those young youngsters in, in pursuit of their dreams and, and a message to those African fans? No, what, what the, my biggest message has always been is, you know, I'm an I'm, I'm, a, I'm an African born child. I came from there. I was I was born there and I was raised there for a while until I moved over here to the States. And um, my roots are very strong from there. Um, very deep. I, I, I remember my time there very, very vividly and very well. And and one of those things is when you're growing up and and the country is kind of the way it is, certain countries, it's, it's tough to, to see yourself out of that situation. It's tough to ever see yourself. Like, I, I, you know, we had a well. We had to go out and get fresh water, boil the water in order to be able to have stuff to cook for the day and take care of ourselves on a daily. And this is what I come from. And I know this is what a majority of some African kids are, are going through and living in right now. And for me, being that symbol of hope that, you know, just because this is a situation that you're in right now, this is not necessarily where you're going to end up. Nobody knows tomorrow. My story is living proof of that. And uh, Israel Adesanya is living proof of that. And of course, Francis Ngannou is, is living proof of that. And so it's just that message that let all my Africans and, and not just Africans, but people all over the world know that. You know, your situation, your circumstances today are not always where God is designed for you to end up. Inspiring. Thank you very much. So best of luck. And uh, as always, Africa is behind you. Thank you. I appreciate that.